Welcome. As we get ready to start today, I hope you have your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. Let's uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll jump right in here. There's some interesting stuff to talk about. Um, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the goodness that you've given us and given it to us. But we need to be taught by the Holy Spirit. So lead us, cause us to think right, to receive it, and to grow by it. Because we are your children. We want to grow in the Lord. Thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 17, is where we're going to start looking. After telling believers that they've been brought into God's family to be inheriting children of God in Christ Jesus, he reminds them that they also will be partaking of the sufferings that Christ suffered as well. In verse 18, Paul says, wait in the balance. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. And so he's saying, look, here's the deal. We will have to go through tough times in this world, but when we get to glory, it will be worth it. Be ready. Be looking forward to that. So he he begins to have us consider things about life. And on this wet ball of dirt that we have going around and around our sun, we're not yet where we belong. This world's been knocked askew. And at its roots, it craves for the things to be set right again. Let's look at verses 19 through 22. I'm going to read them. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What Paul is saying here is that because the world was knocked off its kilter, there's a natural part inside that it longs to be back in balance, back in the place where things are how they're supposed to be. At its root, it craves for things to be set right. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, I'm just going to summarize. We're not, you can turn there on your own. But it, it says, look, God first created, in verses 19 and 20, it says, God put into this world the basics about himself. And if a person really wants to, they can learn the starting place of knowing God from looking at creation and properly interpreting what they see. It's an interesting thing that you can see the different conclusions that people draw when looking at the same, same thing. For example, people look around at the evidences and say, here's evidence for the flood of Noah. And others look at it and say, oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't show the flood of Noah. It shows the long ages of time and the progression of, of, of things. Well, look at the Grand Canyon, for example. Perfectly shows the layers, the way that waters are, are uh, silted out and, and the layers are laid down after a flood. And at the same time, some look at it and say, no, that shows long ages of time. And the landfolds and layers are evidence of a rapid uh, sediment from from flooding, and yet two people look at the same thing and they say, oh, no, that doesn't show that. That shows this. Well, in Romans 1, it says that people went away from accepting that God was a creator and instead began to turn from God to be absorbed in and to worship and look give too much uh, credit to the things that God made. So stuff became more important than the one who made the stuff. And as people began to look to creation as if it was all there was, they turned their honor, their values, their uh, dependence on the things here. So God said, well, you want to see where that takes you? And he let them go. And in Romans 1, you read about it. He turned them over to him. And it hasn't turned out well. It turns out that people have a sin nature that pulls away from God. And there's no end to how far they can sink if they reject the God who is life and righteousness. In uh, chapter 1, verse 22, it says, professing themselves to become to be wise, and, and then it goes on and explains this. Uh, in America, for example, there are many who claim to be all about the science, and then they claim 
that the world just spontaneously produced life that kept overcoming impossible odds again and again and again, doing the impossible repeatedly until better things came about, until voila, here we are. And uh, that seems uh, interesting and a, and a funny way to look at how things came to be to me when there's so much design in the in the makeup of what the world is. But if there's no creator, there's no one to answer to for what we do. And if there's no one to answer to, what stops us from the most despicable acts of lust and greed and cruelty? Well, if you look at our history, you see apparently nothing if we reject God. So my point is, in Romans chapter 8, that all of this world that God gave over to their own desires, and, and we get to these same verses that I just read, verses 19 to 22, it leaves the world with a craving that things be put back right. And then it goes on in verses 23 through 25 in Romans 8, listen to this. Not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we've been saved. But hope that's seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Okay, what this is saying is, even the children of God, those who have placed their faith and trust in the Lord, says that we're frustrated because we've not yet realized all that is and all that is going to be. Fact is, we're stuck in a place where we're not yet home where we've not yet realized the fullness of all God's promised us. In fact, our experiences here are decidedly um, unsatisfactory, and we keep open for what ought to be. And Paul reminds us that hoping, and by hoping he means confidently waiting for what's coming, is the right thing for us right now. He says, look, if you already had it all, you wouldn't keep looking forward to what's coming, would you? You wouldn't look to the glory. You wouldn't look to heaven and say, man, I want to get there. Instead, you're left with what is out front, confident it will be, and so you eagerly wait. You, you look forward to, you realize it really is coming. It's just not here yet. But there's a frustration that goes with waiting when we have not yet realized what we're waiting for. It just means it's not time yet. It doesn't mean it's not coming. And here's where people veer off. Do any of you ride buses anymore? Does anyone ride the city bus? We used to when, in this, when we were in San Francisco and different places. Think about this. Say you're at a bus stop waiting for a bus. And the bus is not in sight anywhere. There's a schedule posted there. There's a seat to sit on while you wait. But how logical would it be for you to say, I don't see a bus anywhere. I don't see a bus coming. I haven't seen a bus the whole time I've been here. I don't believe there they ever have come. As a matter of fact, I don't believe there's any such thing as buses. I think this is all made up, that there's nothing to it. Well, others waiting their tail, well, we know there's buses. We've ridden on them before. And you say, ah, oh, you're just confused and delusional. It can't be so. And instead, this bench and this bus stop, I think they just form naturally. I think there's something that just came about. And, and it doesn't prove there's any such thing as buses. I've been here for 40 minutes and not seen a sign of a bus. Therefore, there can't be buses. Well, you say, what stupid reasoning? Why would you think like that? Well, listen to what 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4 says. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, well, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep. All continues just as it has from the beginning of creation. And Peter goes on in that section to say that that sort of reasoning, like just like our bus story, it misses several key truths. Number one, the design of the creator as God made the world. He did it with wisdom, and you can see that wisdom in, in the things you see. Secondly, a flood came and it wiped out all that was, and there was a reset to the creation. Third, the coming judgment is going to burn all this up and there's going to be a whole new heaven and a new earth at some point. But the big thing is this, Paul or Peter says in his writing, God is not pressed for time. He's not intimidated by time's passing. He doesn't age. Critics of his 
of his uh, timetable don't impress him or cause him to feel like he's got to hurry and get things done. It's not like how we look at stuff. As a matter of fact, Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says it this way. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons with their consciences seared and insensitive. Note that the criticisms increase in the last days or in later times. Both Paul and Peter pointed out that one of the marks of time going on, of us getting further and further from the beginning and closer and closer to the end, is this criticism that comes up when people start saying, time marches on. It hasn't changed. Things are going on just like they always did. Therefore, Christ isn't coming back. Well, to draw that conclusion from what's gone on is as foolish as me saying there's no such thing as buses because I've been here for 40 minutes and no bus game. In Romans 8, 24 and 25, it points out that we're sure that God can be trusted in hope we've been saved. We don't yet realize it, and yet we eagerly continue to wait for what he's promised. In Romans 4.21, it points out that Abraham believed God and for what was promised, even in the face of what, of what seeming impossible. He's an old man. His wife's an old woman. And God promises they're going to have a child. And he believed God. Even in his old age, when it seemed like it was past physical possibility, he believed God. And just like Abraham's example, we, it says in verse 25 of Romans 8, with perseverance, wait eagerly for what God's promised. We wait for the redemption and the final call that finishes what God started here. And it's in hope that we live. We live maintaining this hope, this assurance of what God will bring about. Once more, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite verses, Hebrews 6, verse 19 and 20. It says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. The lines hooking us by this hope are firmly hooked in the very holy of holies where God is. And because that's where our hope is hooked, you can depend on those lines never parting. You're not going to break away. If you hold on to the hope, it's an anchor of the soul. And when things swirl around us, when storms come, when things happen, you're anchored firmly and you keep on. These lines are run right into the very presence of God. The nearness of God is our good. Hang on. Don't quit. Don't stop hoping just because You've gone through your period of time here on earth, and it's coming to an end. At the age I am now, I look back to when I was young and now how things have gone by. I've been told my entire life that Jesus could come at any time. And I am firmly believing, especially as I hear more and more criticisms of Christianity and of the message of the gospel, I'm more and more believing that we're getting nearer and nearer to the end times, that there won't be long until Jesus is back. But I look at my 70 years and I think, well, that's a whole lifetime of hearing this and it hasn't happened. And here's what I think. If you look at all of time from the beginning until now, 70 years? If you put it out in a line, you couldn't even pick out what 70 years was. It's the tiniest part of that whole deal. Just because it's my perspective and my life doesn't mean that that's a long time to wait. And when we get into glory, we're going to look back and say, oh, that went fast. Because it is quick. It's going quicker than you think. And it's only our perspective that makes us look and think, oh, time's dragging on. Well, time is hurtling quickly towards the very end when Jesus is going to wrap up all this. And therefore, the time is limited for anyone to turn to and believe in Jesus Christ. It's coming quick. Don't put it off. There could be at any time the final call. So if you have not committed yourself to Jesus, do it now so that you will be ready. And if a little bit of time comes between the time you Believe in and choose Jesus and the end, good. You'll be, have a chance to grow a bit. But we don't know when the end is coming. So grab hold, 
Don't quit. Keep on. It's worth hanging on to. There's coming glory that will make all this look like nothing. Are you ready for it? We need to live as if we are. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for the word. Thanks for your goodness to us. Thanks for how you have laid out the way things are. We feel that frustration. We look at things and we're criticized. People look at us and say, oh yeah, they've been saying that about Jesus for a long time. Well, of course they do. But in our little lifetimes, we're a flash in the pan. There isn't a bit of us that goes by in an entire lifetime that can hardly make a mark on the time timeline. I pray that you'll help us in the time you give us to be faithful to hold on. Give us a confidence in the hope that is placed in Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, are you keeping on? Look forward to what God has planned. Look forward to the glory that he has promised. Look forward to the place he is preparing for you. And if you are Christ, don't quit until we get there. And then I think we'll look at each other with wonder and say, whoa, this is what we were waiting for? Well worth it. Keep on, and God bless you till we get together again. See you next time.